Welcome everyone uh, to today's collection close up. Uh, I'm Fiona Maxwell, the Director of Museum Operations and Communications at the Francis Willard House Museum. This program today is part of our collection close up series. Um, and we are excited to bring this to you via Zoom because we are able to reach many people um, who otherwise would not be able to attend. Um, collection close ups are a new feature of our programming this year. Uh, they grew out of our uh, very popular handicraft hours, um, and they are meant to highlight items from our collection that help us tell a broader narrative that we are focusing on this year, which is called Knowledge is Power, Women in Education, um, in honor of Francis Willard's 150th anniversary as the president of the Evanston College for Ladies and Dean of Women at Northwestern. We are exploring um, the meaning of women's education for women of Willard's generation. And we're doing this through um, many online resources on our website, on our blog. Um, and we are also doing this through virtual programs like this one today. Uh, so in case you are unaware, the Francis Willard House Museum is the home of Francis Willard, uh, the 19th century suffragist and social reformer, and the longtime president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. You can find out more about uh, the Willard House, Willard's biography and the WCTU on our website, which I will put a link to in the chat. And we, uh, though we are closed for tours um, right now, we are going to be reopening for Women's History Month in March. Uh, so do keep an eye on um, our website and our social media to find out when you can visit us in person. Uh, also, if you don't already get our email newsletter, please be sure to go on our website and sign up. That is the best way to keep track of all of our programming and new releases in terms of content. Uh, you can also make a donation on the website to support our work and programs like this talk, which is free. Um, I will put a link to our donation page in the chat. And um, so we will have about 20 minutes of presentation today. Um, followed by time for questions. We will uh, have you use the chat for questions, which you can submit as the talk goes along. And then I will be monitoring the chat and share your questions when we get to that time. And we will also be recording this talk and sharing it later, later via our YouTube channel if you would like to watch it again or let others know. So without further ado, let me turn it over to our speaker today, which is Janet Olson, the wonderful archivist. Ah. Okay. All right. Am I audible, vision, visible, et cetera? Let me know if I'm You're not. Great. You're great. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Fiona, uh, for all that introduction. And I um, really am looking forward to doing this talk, although uh, some of you may have heard a different version of it at different times, but it's a topic that is an is of unending fascination to me. So I hope that others will enjoy it and that people who have heard it will re-enjoy it. Um, so a scandal in Evanston. Uh, the scandalous item under consideration here has interested me for several years. It has taken me that long to understand its context and to reconcile its apparently contradictory purpose and tone with what I know about Francis Willard's character. I hope you will find the story as fascinating as I do. So let's go back to the start of the controversy. Hold on to your seats. Uh, a November day in 1873. Wait, now my screen does not want to move. Just a second. Come on. Uh, on that day in 1873, readers of the Chicago Daily Tribune were surprised to learn that a flagrant set of injustices is being perpetrated every week in the staid and sober confines of Evanston, which demands public notice and the adoption of immediate measures for its correction. The Northwestern University, located in that village, long ago threw its doors open to women on terms of equality. In place of this, the young ladies are compelled to go to a confessional once a week and answer 13 questions, many of the, of the most exasperating character. 
As it stands at present, this rule is a petty humiliation and places every young lady in a most mortifying position. If they have any spirit, they will continue to agitate until this clear women's right is conceded. The 13 humiliating questions referred to in the Tribune editorial were found in the self-reports that each woman student was required to complete and return to Northwestern's Dean of Women, Ms. Frances Willard, each week. To understand the shocking accusation, a level that Frances Willard, already well known for progressive stand on women's rights, we need to step back a few more years. Northwestern University had opened in 1855 as a liberal, liberal arts college for men. 14 years later, on June 23, 1869, the Board of Trustees resolved to admit women students on the same terms as men. However, the process of incorporating women into the university was not that simple, as was the situation at most colleges attempting co-education at the time, the thorniest issue was the problem of supervising women, a minority of students, in a mixed population of men and women. Faculty, administrators, parents of potential students, and women students themselves all had a stake in addressing the matter of government. In 1869, when co-education was adopted at Northwestern, the school's president, Erastus Haven, admitted that there were challenges to providing the watch care that women students' parents expected and demanded in order to prevent the inconveniences and evils which many dread. Fortunately, a group of Evanston women was already in the process of establishing the separate Evanston College for Ladies in a temporary location just south of campus. A coordinate or a sister relationship with Northwestern seemed to offer the perfect solution for both institutions. The Evanston College for Ladies would provide housing and home-like supervision for the women students attending Northwestern, as well as offering courses in music and art that men could attend. Incidentally, the Evanston College for Ladies at its founding uh, appointed Frances Willard as its president, and she became the first woman president of a woman's college. By July 1871, the Evanston College for Ladies had raised $30,000 in pledges to build a permanent building across from Northwestern. However, this utopian plan went up in smoke when the pledge when the pledged funding was lost in the great chicago fire in october of 1871 two years later the evanston college for ladies board of directors realized it would not be able to raise funds for its building and it reluctantly decided to turn the enterprise over to northwestern the evanston college for ladies officially became the women's college of northwestern in june 1873 Frances Willard, no longer the college president, was appointed as Northwestern's first dean of women. In that role, she tried to maintain a separate supervisory structure for the women students, but her authority was much diminished by the university's new president, Charles Fowler. It became clear that Willard's concern about assuaging parental worries and building strong, self-reliant women not match Fowler's ideas about minimal rules for all students with no special authority vested in the Dean of Women. What ensued was a strangely paradoxical development, a conflict between Charles Fowler, who heartily approved equal education for women, but who was not concerned about separate rules for men and women, versus Frances Willard, who strongly at, whose support for women's rights was well known, but who strongly advocated separate supervision for women. What was Willard's reasoning? Willard knew that women would be in the minority at Northwestern and would have trouble holding their own. She firmly believed that accepting responsibility for their own behavior was a crucial step towards independence of thought and action for women. She also knew that parents would be less likely to send their daughters to a school where their conduct would not be appropriately supervised. And so she introduced an honor system, the self-report. 
The printed self-report form asked 13 questions about behavior with space for each lady, each young lady, to respond truthfully. The reports were then submitted to Ms. Willard. There's no indication that they were forwarded to parents. That's why we have so many completed copies of the form in the archives these days. The point was that the women could would have the moral fiber to respond honestly to the questions and to take responsibility for the actions that they knew were not appropriate. So let's take a look at the questions to see how they must have appeared to the Tribune editorialist and to us on first glance. Leaving aside the very quaint wording and the colorful picture we get of student life in the 1870s, which is part of what makes this collection ob object so interesting, we can see that the questions are divided between academic behavior and what we would now call extracurricular activities. Four of the questions, let's see if I can point, uh, one, 10, 11, 12, all regard uh, matters of studying, getting enough sleep, and paying attention, not whispering, not being noisy. Seven questions, though, uh, two through six, eight, and nine, deal with obtaining permission to engage in semi-social activities, many of which could involve gentlemen students with the implication that seeking permission would prevent irresponsible, perhaps compromising actions. The final question, number 13, which I will read, have you during the past week done anything which violates the spirit of the regulations of this school or which you have reason to think your teachers could not approve? The, that question requires the student to think for herself and honestly assess her own behavior. I think this is the most important question reflecting Willard's conviction that self-reliance can be taught. Aside from question 13, though, and without knowing the context of Willard's motivation, the self-report does seem both intrusive and authoritarian, not conducive, conducive to the freedom that we would expect that for Willard to be an advocate of. Women whose self-reports consistently indicated that they have followed the rules and taken responsibility for their actions were entered into the role of honor club. If they maintained stand their standing in the role of honor club for a whole term, they would be added to the self-governed list and freed from the requirement to submit the weekly self-reports. Self-governed girls would take this pledge I will try so to act that if all others followed my example, our school would need no rules whatsoever. It seems that the women self-report seriously. There's the, an example of a completed self-report. And you can see that Miss Potter answered the questions, that she considered her behavior acceptable for most of the questions, but she honestly admits that she whispered in chapel that very morning. In other examples, students explained why they misstepped, they forgot, they didn't realize the time, etc. And then came the anonymous editorial in the Tribune. November 26, 1873, headed Women's Rights in Evanston, which in nearly 1,000 words, accused Willard of de denying equal rights to women students. The editorial scoffs at the need for the exasperating questionnaire at all, since young men didn't have to do anything similar. And he focuses on the questions dealing with women's interactions with men, walking to the post office or the depot, leave, traveling in groups of fewer than four, entertaining callers. He points out that since men don't have the same restrictions, what can a young lady do if a gentleman friend, a classmate, happens to be walking by the lake as, at the same time that she is? Is she to give him the mitten? Is it her fault? It must have been a slow news day. What followed from this article was, well, not really a scandal, maybe, but certainly in quiet Northwestern University's terms, a matter of unwanted public discussion. 
The editorial generated a flurry of pro and con letters to the Tribune, and it spread to other newspapers in other cities, lasting until about December of 1873. Most letters were unsigned or signed only with initials or a nickname. Signed letters to the Tribune included one from noted suffragist Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Stanton vigorously opposed the self-report. She characterized Willard's rules as an invidious assumption that boys can be trusted with liberties, but girls cannot. She expressed disappointment that Willard, by confirming one code of morals for man, another for women, seemed to be contradicting the basic principles of women's rights. Willard's rebuttal to the editorial appeared in the Tribune on November 27th. Willard thanked the original editorialist for a well-meant defense of women's rights, but pointed to women's right to a noble, poised self-character. And, and described the self-reports as wholesome but liberal school discipline that would help women attain that right. Most Western students, both men and women, responded to the Tribune feeding frenzy by supporting Willard. The Northwestern student newspaper, which at the time was called the Tripod, published three articles rebutting the criticism including one article by a spokeswoman for 49 of the Women's College residents. Their letter was reprinted in the Evanston Index newspaper under the headline, What the Girls Say. The Evanston Index noted that the number of signatories to this article was evidence of the fact that the ladies are not restive under those terrible restraints. Another long or article in the index, written by the parent whose daughter was at Northwestern, also staunchly supported Willard's mild, sisterly, and agreeable government, adding that under Miss Willard's care, young ladies can hardly fail to become better women as well as better scholars. Although the Tribune letter writing battle ended in December and had generated more responses in favor of Willard's actions than negative responses, the issue continued to irritate Northwestern's administration. Meanwhile, Willard continued to use the self-reports, even, even adding two more questions in early 1874. In the spring of 1874, Northwestern's Board of Trustees met with a committee of women connected to the former Evanston College for Ladies to discuss the situation. The women defended Willard, stating that the male faculty did not provide for extra supervision for women and that there needed to be more input from the dean of women. But Willard, in a startling turn of events, offered to resign from Northwestern, saying that she was firmly convinced that she should always be a discord in the, in the faculty with her views and opinions on the government of young ladies. As reported in the meeting minutes, and really expressing Northwestern's opinion uh, of, the, of the whole thing, thus settled a matter that has created a sensation, not only locally, but in the entire Northwest. Despite considered, continued support from her students though, Willard left Northwestern in June, 1874, after submitting a 19 page letter of resignation. Was that the end of the story? The self-report system initiated by Willard, the suffragist champion of women's equal rights, was certainly not an effort to make men's and women's rules equal. Willard's goal was to make women self-reliant and make them think for themselves, but still to adhere to social norms, at least in this collegiate setting, a new frontier when men, men and women were thrown together at a dangerous age. Would she have continued to advocate for such strict rules for women in later years after women became a familiar sight on from former all-male -mar campuses, so numerous that they eventually often outnumbered and got better grades than the men? It's a moot point. While Willard left the field of education in 1874 to spend the rest of her career with the Women's Christian Temperance Union, she continued her efforts to inspire women's independence with such books as How to Win, a book for 
1886. And the last book she wrote before she died in 1898, Occupations for Women. At Northwestern, deans of women who served after Willard did not continue the self-reports, but they did continue to contend with parents' worries that their daughters would be subject to the evils resulting from unsuperv unsupervised freedom. The question of separate rules of behavior for women and who sets those rules persisted at Northwestern as at many other co-educational schools into the 1970s. But that is, that is another fascinating story. To conclude, I hope you see what makes this little object, the self-report form, so interesting to me. The questions it raises, the assumptions, the implications, and the light that it throws on the history of women's education. To me, now that I know the story behind the self-reports, the self-reports evoke the challenges that women faced as they sought the empowerment that knowledge and education could give them. You can read more about women's education in early Evanston and about how Frances Willard's own quest for knowledge intersected with it in our blog post series, Knowledge is Power. And I'm sure Fiona will be putting that link in the chat. And so I thank you for not whispering during the session. And you may now feel free to ask questions or make comments. Thank you, Janet. And I will put the link to our women's education blog posts here in the chat for anyone who wants to check out that resource. Um, and yeah, I would second Janet's encouragement to put questions in the chat. Oh, yeah. Okay. I can share the self-report form, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, oh, and just in, in case anyone is looking for their self-report form, I attached it with the Zoom link. So on the same email that you got the Zoom link, you should find a PDF of the self-report that- Oh, um, yeah, that, that's the oh, modern version. Yeah, yeah. All right, it's, let me see if I can get back to the um, actual self-report in my PowerPoint. Okay, and uh, Janet, if you want to um, send me a PDF of that, I can distribute it to everyone who registered. Um, okay, yeah. Um, yeah. We have a question in the, we have two questions in the chat. So um, first, Janet, um, did the Northwestern leaders seem to have any regrets at Francis Willard's departure? Uh, yes, uh, well, uh, thank you, Sarah, for that question. Uh, I would say, um, I think they were kind of relieved as, as their remark in the, um, at the end of the board meeting, thus settled a matter that has created a sensation. Northwestern didn't want people creating sensations. Um, and uh, so I think uh, it was just, it was just better for her to resign. I, I mean, her 19 page letter just goes on and on about how she couldn't do what she wanted to do. And, and and this was a whole new situation for Northwestern. They didn't have an administrative layer at that time. The faculty did uh, administrative jobs, like there was a library, a faculty member who was the essentially the head of the library. Uh, there was no dean of men, uh, so the faculty, which was all male except for Willard, had to supervise the students and make rules and things like that, and they. The men were just so wary of getting involved with supervising women, uh, and they didn't want Willard raising this, you know, raising this question too much. So, yeah, I think I would say that for all the people who loved Willard as a teacher and as a colleague, uh, the and even board of trustees members who who were very uh, fond of her, I, I think it was just easier for everybody if she left. So we've got two questions that um, are asking, how similar were these rules for women at other colleges at the time? Are there similar self-reports at any institution, single sex or co-ed that admitted women? Um, 
This is a question I really haven't researched, and I know I should because it's an obvious question. I know that the um, that other uh, women's colleges and women's um, um, so women's seminaries, the FemSems, uh, did often have something like an honor system or a sort of a, a behavioral checklist because Willard used one at one of the one of her earlier teaching um, uh, assignments uh, in a, a female seminary. And in fact, one of the letter writers uh, who wrote in to uh, talk about to in response to the editorial in the Tribune, one of them had said, while well, she was, had been at a, a female seminary and that she found the self-reports uh, and the honor system were completely useless because everybody lied. Uh, I don't know what the men's, um, what the men's colleges did. I know they did have rules, but uh, this was, uh, but the co-education aspect was such a new thing that knowing what to do about women, it it was a, a problem for 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 all of the schools. I mean, uh, Erastus Haven, in fact, when he came to Northwestern, he came from Michigan. Uh, he had been president of the University of Michigan, and he had tried to institute co-education there, but it just didn't get done while he was there. Just there are so many problems. So someone who knows more uh, about higher education, the history of higher education in general, will have more to say on this, but um, that's what I know. To follow up, we have a couple questions about um, a secondary scandal, but um, before we get to that, I just wanted to quickly ask, um, you, you touched on the idea that Willard wanted the women to kind of demonstrate that they were able to um, have personal responsibility. And I was wondering if you could speak a little more about um, how, uh, I, I just happen to know from some of my own research into Northwestern's history, um, what that meant for women to prove that they were capable of essentially self-government and whether that brings a, a more nuanced meaning to these self-reports. Yeah, definitely. Well, the thing that you see in the course of Northwestern's uh, history of coeducation, and I think it's it's echoed uh, many other places too, um, is that women. Um, it, it was such a, a dicey thing. Um, who was supervising them? What was being supervised? What role the women themselves had in in the, in saying what kind of uh, self, what kind of government they wanted. It went from being really, I think, um, you know, supervision top down from the Dean of Women uh, at, at schools as as this as co-education spread. It, it uh, went from being just top down Dean of Women setting rules. It, it came to be women figuring out their own uh, system of self-government. They, they, women, that's what I mean. That's the fascinating part of how it moved up into the 1970s. There were separate women's self-government organizations at many, many schools. Um, and there was a national women's self-government uh, group association, which had meetings and things like that. But it was because the women themselves felt that they needed some kind of support, some kind of uh, some kind of set of of standards of behavior, um, kind of still and still working off that old justification of of going off to at a school at this young dangerous age where there were men as well as women. Uh, the older women students would so instruct the freshman women in how to behave. Uh, there were just these these. I mean, just reflecting the entire double standard of men and women, this is where it goes beyond women's self-government in terms of self-reliance and all that. It goes into women themselves setting rules that, that confirms the double standard. And that's what really ended abruptly in the 1970s. So you see this, this whole sort of passage of time as rules came and went the women were making rules. The women were, were making rules for themselves. 
Um, even after the point where women were uh, could join in on the student government with the men's students, I mean, at the point when men had, you know, were self-governing uh, and not just, you know, taking advice from the then dean of men, um, the, the women um, maintained a separate self-government organization, a women's uh, a women's group in addition to the general student government. So there's this whole long period of how how things changed and you know, house mothers and curfews and and all these things. And you find uh, my 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 other fascination with this is that when you get into the like 30s and 40s, that this this uh, self-government thing that the older women students you know, supervising the younger ones. And, you know, it, it turns into, this turns into people telling on each other and, you know, mm -hmm. somebody's watching you. Are you wearing Bermuda shorts at breakfast? Oh no. Did you stay too late in the dating parlor? <gasps> Did you come in late? Did you sneak over the wall? You know, anyway, it gets into this whole long thing, which, which is so different from the self-report issue. Um, I like to compare the two and say, well, which one was actually better? Is it having your house mother or your RA spying on you saying you were on the telephone too long? Or is it you filling out a report saying, gosh, I know I shouldn't have been on the phone that long? Anyway. Yeah. And to add, um, just because I happened to to recently written that blog post about Willard's college days, she has an interesting passage where she reflects on how being in that earlier model where it was much more here are the rules and abide by them she felt like there was a lot of kind of lying and not admitting when you had done wrong and the only people who admitted they did wrong were very good uh well-behaved students anyways so that was part of what inspired her to think you know it's showing women can really take responsibility for their own actions which is kind of where the the crux of this was it good? Was it bad? Was it, you know, it gets very complicated. Um, to move back to the chat questions, uh, we got a couple questions about um, people who have heard that Willard left Northwestern because of a disagreement with Fowler, who was um, Charles Fowler, the president of the university, who was um, her ex-fiance. And um, so they're wondering, you know, is, is that still part of why she resigned? Um, how big of a factor was the self-reports? Uh, unfortunately, I think that that uh, scandal thread is just kind of non-existent. Um, from what I know, and you know, I certainly could be wrong, and and uh, this is a matter of my opinion. Uh, but from what I've read, Willard and Fowler actually—I mean, they they were engaged for a few months in 1862, and you know, here we are in 18, a whole new world in 1873. Um, uh, I think they they got—I mean, they liked each other, they respected each other, but as Willard herself once put it, and this is one of my favorite things that she said, was she considered herself to be Queen Elizabeth, Elizabeth I, of course, um, and uh, Fowler was Napoleon, and those two could never, I mean, they both were, um, let's say, powerful characters, and so for getting along in this situation, um, I, I don't think that worked, but he did, he was supportive of her in her later life, and his sister was very involved in the WCTU all her life, uh, so I don't think there was, I don't think there was a personal aspect mm -hmm. to the uh to the self-report and and Fowler was only at Northwestern for a couple of years because it really was not his um ideal job he he went on to greater things he had no experience in education he you know he was a great speaker and you know, he had good ideas and things but he um you know he didn't last that long as president of the university. So I think, I don't think that their short-lived romance was was um, a factor. But I'm willing to discuss it. It makes a good what if. Yeah. All right, thank you for the, the clarification. Um, that's all the questions from the chat. So, um, and we are after 4.30. 
Uh, so I suppose we can bring it to a close here. Um, thank you, Janet, so much for sharing your expertise. It was a wonderful presentation. And thank you to everyone who made time for us this Sunday. Um, I will stop recording.